Grace, mercy, and peace are yours in abundance through the knowledge of God and of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Scroll through the headlines on Google News and you'll read things like this. Bride falls to her death on honeymoon. Man contracts rare brain-eating amoeba. Family killed in head-on collision. And news stories like these persist not merely because of our society's taste for the morbid, but because there's part of each one of us that can't look away. That when we see the train wreck, we're riveted by it. And as we watch in horror, we can't help but think, what if that would happen to me? All of us, to a greater or lesser degree, do this. We watch the news and the fear of the possible grips us. We learn about new ways to die, different diseases that we should be afraid of. Or we visit with a dear friend and we learn about all that they're struggling with and we walk away sad with our friend, of course, but also with the nagging anxiety that what happened to them could just as likely happen to me and to my family. And given the amount of news out there, the information that's available to us, there's more now than ever that we can worry about, more now than ever that might fill our hearts with anxiety and fear. And all of us, to a greater or a lesser degree, have found ways to live with this fear, to set it aside, apart from the gospel of Jesus Christ. We look at the incredible things that our medical technology can do for us, and and we comfort ourselves by, by saying, no matter what happens, there's always something more that can be done. There's always one more thing the doctors can try. Or we play the game of odds and we try to convince ourselves that the odds of something like that happening to me are just so slim. Yes, these things happen, we assert, but they only happen to others. They won't happen to me. Imagine a young bride on her wedding day taking vows in a little town called Nain. She knew, of course, in theory, that spouses can die untimely deaths. But like most newlyweds, I'm sure that that young woman was not thinking anything like that as she began her married life. No, she thought, that happens, but that only happens to someone else. And again, when that woman gave birth to her first, her only son, and she cradled that sweet newborn in her arms, she looked at his sweet, tender face, and she knew that children can die. She had heard the stories of others who had lost children, but never in that woman's darkest moments would she ever have imagined that she would first have to cradle her dead husband's head in her arms and kiss his cold lips one last time, and then, horror of horrors, lightning would strike the same place twice, And she would pick the lifeless body of her son up in her arms and once again kiss his cold, dead lips goodbye. This woman's story unearths our deepest and greatest fears. What if what happened to her happened to me? How would I make it through? burying a spouse. And as I do so, clinging to that one last light in my life, my own flesh and blood, my own child, my own son, in whose shoulders at that funeral you can feel not only the grief but the strength rising, resolute to do his dad proud since dad was going into the ground, only to turn around and feel the strength leaving those same shoulders and have to march out to the same cemetery to lay that one last light of life in the ground. This woman's story would make good clickbait. Woman tragically loses husband and only son in one-two punch. But friends, this isn't clickbait, and you know that it doesn't happen only to others. Some of us have buried spouses and know the loneliness of being a widow 
or a widower. Some of us have experienced receiving a terminal diagnosis and having to come to grips with our own mortality. Some of us know the unspeakable grief of losing a child. Just to think of it, to speak of it, takes the loveliness not only out of Nain, but out of this whole world. Death hurts, and, and that mostly for the survivors. When our loved ones die, we ache, we grieve. And what is left for us to do but either hang our head and sob or put on a resolute and determined face, but what is left for us to do either way but to pick our way out to the burying ground, to say our goodbyes, all the while wishing that we were the lucky one who had died. That's what was left to do for that widow at Nain, going to lay her only son next to her dead husband. The last light of her life had gone out, and you can hardly imagine a more dismal, a gloomier, grayer scene than what took place that day in Nain. You see the woman sobbing, the, the town people huddled around her, and, and worst of all, the young man laid out, cold and dead, the vivid reminder that these things happen, and sometimes they happen close to home. Survey that, that gray and gloomy scene, and then something catches your eye. On the road heading in to Nain is a brilliant, shining light a light that cuts through all of the gray and all of the gloom, a light that was coming for that widow, and though she didn't know it, didn't look for it, didn't ask for it, and didn't deserve it, that bright and shining light was coming to her, and it was her only hope and her only comfort in her most desperate hour. And before she knew it, that light and the crowd with him were going to stop Nain's funeral dead in its tracks. Literally, that's what Jesus and his followers did. They came and they met the procession. And mark this, in most of the other miracles that Jesus performs, it starts with somebody going to Jesus, begging him to help, praying for mercy, crying out to Jesus. But, but not this time. This time it's all Jesus. Jesus is the one who sees what's taking place. Jesus is the one who puts two and two together. Jesus is the one who grasps this woman's plight Jesus is the one who knows the unspeakable sadness in her heart. Jesus is the one who has compassion. And Jesus is the one who on that day made that widow's wildest dream come true. Granted to her her most wishful, wistful wish. Think about this. God does not just lecture us about death from heaven above in a place untainted by sorrow and tears and crying and pain. No, God walks our streets and he meets death face to face. He sees the lines of sorrow on a widow's face. He knows what it's like to attend the funeral of a child. And Incredibly, he has seen the grave from the inside out, literally. Yes, in Jesus, our God has met us in the moments of our deepest fears and our profoundest griefs. He's seen it all. And when he sees us there, he speaks. And he says, Yes, these things can and do happen, and they don't only happen to others. But don't cry. Have you forgotten what I am capable of doing? That's what Jesus said to the widow. Don't cry, and I can assure you that the people in Nain that day never forgot what God is capable of doing. For now Jesus went up and touched the coffin stopped the pallbearers dead in their tracks, and no doubt those men thought that this, that, that this Jesus was going to stop and say a few words of condolence, if not to the widow, then to the whole crowd that was gathered there. Little did they know that the brilliant, shining light of life was standing right next to them, and he had so much more to say than my sympathies to you. 
Well, Jesus did have something to say, but not to the widow and not to the crowd. He addressed the corpse. Young man, he said. Jesus didn't even take the time to learn this boy's name. Young man, and who speaks to dead people anyways? Young man, Jesus said, I say to you, get up. And in an instant, everybody in Nain realized they had never seen anything like it. And that they, from this day on, would tell the world that Nain was not only lovely, but redeemed. And that widow, not only comforted, but blessed with the certainty, the knowledge to carry her through the rest of her days and and the trust and comfort to see her through the hour of her own death. The confidence to confess, I believe in the resurrection of the body. For she saw it with her own eyes. Her son, who was dead, sat up and, and oh, the joy that woman must have felt to hear in her ears the sound of her dear son's voice. Oh, the wonder, as she threw her arms around him and felt those same shoulders with life in them again. As Jesus gave her son back to her. Because, brothers and sisters, this is what happens wherever Jesus is and whenever he is present. He speaks and there is life. He speaks to people, to you and me at our baptism. And there he speaks a word of life to to us who are born perhaps physically alive but spiritually dead with no future. He speaks the simple words of holy baptism and he speaks life into us. Life that never ends and He doesn't just speak to someone. He speaks to you. And he speaks to me. He speaks to all of the baptized in Christ. And it's true. Death cannot end our gladness. Because we are baptized into Christ. It's what happens wherever Jesus is present. And so he gives us his true body and blood. That body which once lay in a dead, cold, and dead in a tomb of his own but rose again from the dead and now is the food of life. The gift of forgiveness. And you know that wherever there is the forgiveness of sins, there is life and salvation. And that in this sacrament, Jesus hands you a little glimpse, a little taste of what we will eat and drink anew with him in his Father's kingdom for all eternity. And though Jesus does not visit our funerals now and turn them into celebrations instantly, You and I walk away from Nain with the certainty that what happened there isn't an exception or something that only happens to others but won't happen to me. This is one headline I can guarantee you are one day going to be at the center of for the day and the hour have been set when this same Jesus is going to visit your grave and he will speak to you, young or old, man or woman, and he will say, get up. And your body, no matter how long it's been dead and how decayed it is, will hear the voice of Jesus and get up and live. And on that day, all the dead in Christ will be brought together and he will give back to us dearly loved husbands and wives, sons and daughters. Because wherever there is Jesus, there's only life, and only gladness, and only joy. In an age where there's so much fear, so much anxiety, so much to worry about and so many ways to die, we need to more than ever to teach our children and to teach ourselves to grieve. We have better hope than just there's always something more that we can try. But we know that this world is broken and death is stalking each one of us and we don't know when it's going to claim us. We know that death hurts and it's going to continue to do so. But we don't have to grieve without hope. Our hope is in Jesus who has promised us that on the day of his return He will give us, with the most compassion we've ever known, his great and awesome command, don't cry. And we won't. 
ever again. Because where there is Jesus, there is life. And so we walk away from Nain knowing that we can confess with certainty, I believe in the resurrection of the body. Amen. Please stand. The peace of God which surpasses all understanding now guard and keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.